Welcome, everyone, to the What Would You Change movie podcast. We are the Super Monkey Fighters. I am Loki, here with Monkey Feathers and Papa Nugget. And I know at one point in time I was trying to alternate back and forth with the intro. I don't pay attention to that anymore, so if it's the same person every single time, I apologize if somebody feels like they're getting left out. So offended. I'm I'm sure you guys are terribly offended by all of that. I quit. <laughs> Camera off, everything. Oh, that's like great. We'll just roll roll jazz music and we're done. Technical difficulties the whole <laughs> Technical time. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Which would be on par with a lot of our recordings anyway. It should so. be inter- inter- okay. interpersonal <laughs> difficulties. Interpersonal <laughs> difficulties. That, that'll be the next one we'll do. <laughs> Instead of a <laughs> instead of a TV screen, it's like a therapist and two people yep, sitting it'll be on a, a couch. therapist office. And yes, <laughs> there we go. That'll work. Um, anyway, interpersonal difficulties aside, um, this week we are going through Dune, the new one. Of course, this was directed by Denis Villeneuve. Uh, it was written by John Spitz, Spates. Go with Spates on that one, uh, as well as Denis Villeneuve and Eric Roth. Uh, stars Timothy Chalamet, Rebecca Ferguson, Zendaya, Oscar Isaac, Jason Momoa, Stellan Skarsgård, uh, Stephen McKinley Henderson, I don't know his name, cuts off, Josh Brolin is in it, Javier Bardem, uh, Sharon Duncan Brewster, Chan, Chang Chen, Dave Bautista, David Dashmalian, uh, Charlotte Rampling is in this, uh, as well as Baps Olumoskun and Benjamin Clementine. And that's all I'm going to read. There are more. It was a science fiction novel about the son of a noble family entrusted with the protection of the most valuable asset and most vital element in the galaxy. And true to form, IMDb, you have not improved your blurbs at all. Is the old version any better? The blurb for Dune 1984 is a Duke's son leads desert warriors against the Galactic Emperor and his father's evil nemesis to free their desert world from the Emperor's rule. That's actually closer of a description, I would say. Uh, The movie itself is further from the book in the 1984 one. So I'll preface this with I have not read the book. Um, I have seen the the 1984 one, but that was a long time ago, and I honestly don't really remember it. I I, I did enjoy this this, uh, film. They really set it up to try and be a very, like, serious type of film. Like, very intense, dramatic, um, and I think they did a good job with trying to establish that. The environments, uh, to me, were, like, the biggest part of this film. The environment, costume, all of it worked really well. It really set up the scene, like, on both, on all of the planets. Um, I thought everything was, like, top-notch done very well it really pulled you in to the environment and nothing like at least to me seemed jarring like there there was plenty of opportunity for them to like just miss something they're very grand and detailed uh scenes um throughout the entire film with all of it so the fact that nothing did really stand out to me or pulled me out of it um i would say is impressive the it's one of the things that i think the world of Dune being as far in the future as it is, it's so far in the future and it's so foreign and alien of a world that it can be difficult to wrap your head around. But I think the attention to detail from everything from sets to costumes to all of that, I think really helps build that world without, without needing too much exposition. There is still a lot of exposition, but, there's certain things that happen where you're just like, okay, great spaceship. Awesome. I I understand that this is a spaceship. I look at it and I understand kind of what's going on. Like you don't need to explain to me in great detail. Like I'm reading a, a technical manual. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just, Oh, here's the world. Like, Hey, this giant building comes out of the water at one point in time. Like, okay, great. Yeah. That makes sense that it's sci-fi. That's the thing that could happen. Like it doesn't hold your hand or, insinuate that you can't figure things out just by looking at them. I do like that. And having read the book, having seen all of the other stuff, having, you know, kind of lived this, lived this, uh, having been mostly involved in Dune for a long time. Um, I really appreciated how they 
handled all of that stuff. It really felt like the world of Dune. It was strange and foreign, and but also grounded in something familiar. Yeah, it didn't feel like, oh, here are some cheesy props. And yeah. like this is on uh, a set, obviously. Yeah. And like, yeah. it, it was very immersive and yeah. detailed. Yeah, costumes where people were just wearing cloth clothing and they were elaborate and they were extravagant, but it wasn't like, here's a new fancy blah, blah, blah. I mean, they do have that with the, the still suits and things, but you first inter- you're first introduced to characters and it's like, oh, I'm just wearing this cotton shirt and pants and mm-hmm. eating breakfast with my mom kind of a thing. Like that's, it's, it's grounded in something very familiar which gives you something to kind of anchor to with all the weirdness that goes on. Mm -hmm. I do agree with what you both have said. I think that the sets and even the mixture of CGI incorporated into a lot of the environment, I think was done really well, especially with what they could have done with this movie was just go heavily in the CGI route because it's the future. It's these planets that don't exist. You could just go heavily in the CGI route and do whatever your heart's desired, but they went to a lot of real places and filmed little pieces here and there of what our planet has and incorporated that into their movie and then added CGI on top of that to make it different. And I think that that was a good choice because it did ground it into something familiar that you could recognize and say oh we have something similar on our planet or that's that's a similar human behavior that we've been doing and it's still interesting to see that they're doing it 30,000 years in the future so I did like the sets and I'll also say that I have not read the book so I can't compare what the book (laughs) was and what the movie is I'm honestly in the camp of I really don't care how closely a movie aligns to a book. Um, I feel like like a book is a vastly different medium than mm-hmm. than film or or video. I have a hard time trying to be like like a, a book purist, where it's like, oh, the book was so much better because of this. It's like, yeah, but you're comparing it's apples and oranges, it's, and yeah. like, and I'm fine with directors taking liberties, even on the story. Um, Mm-hmm. to make changes like because it's, I, it's what they're yeah. molding into their version of the story the adaptation of this version of as an adaptation from the book does things better than all of the past ones have ever done i think it it understands what's important and it pushes that to the forefront and it understands what's what doesn't translate well into a new medium and it addresses those uh, those things as it needs to so with like with a book you can spend 20 pages describing a tree you see that for three seconds in a movie and you know what that is Mm -hmm. right so you don't have to tell what's going on with that because you can see it with the world of dune it's massive it's expansive it's complicated there's a lot going on particularly this one it it focuses on the, the the people and the emotions and what's going on with that and it kind of pushes the technology or the more difficult to understand aspects of things. It doesn't just push them under the rug, but it doesn't over explain them. It's just like, here's the thing that happened that, that is right. The, the thing that's probably confusing to pe- people the most, I would think would be the mentats because they don't even, they don't name them as mentats and, and explain what that is. They've got the little black thing on their lips and they, their eyes turn white occasionally there's two of them the house of Trades has one and house harkonnen has one because computers have been outlawed they're people who have been trained or altered to be computers effectively so they can calculate they have vast amounts of information but rather than going through and explaining all of that the guy's eyes turn white for a second and he answers a question and you're like oh okay something's up with that dude that he's he's got some special ability awesome and it's kind of like the benny Gesserit that they do go into a little bit more detail like these are people who have other abilities. Let's not tell you all in detail what these abilities are and what's going on. Let's just give you what you need to know through dialogue or show you what's going on. I like the way that they did that better than in the past. I can see it being confusing for a lot of people, like not knowing what's going on, but 
it's also not as integral to the story as it has been represented in the past. It's, it's a part of the world, but the story that's going on, you don't need to know the details of the mechanics of how all of that works in order to understand what's going on. And I, I really appreciate the way that they did that because the story is not about how the world functions or how the universe functions beyond what you need to know about the politics of it all and all that kind of stuff. The story is about the people, which is my, my biggest like out of all of this is the way that they handled the character of Duncan Idaho. They put a lot more emphasis on him in this than they have in anything else in the past. And I think, I think that's a much more important relationship and character, his relationship with Paul and the Atreides is much bigger than it's been portrayed on screen before. So I really appreciate that they actually took some time to do, do that justice, build that up a lot more. The sacrifice that he ends up making makes more sense having built up a character. Whereas in the past, it's just been like, Oh, I'm here. I'm your bodyguard. And then I sacrifice myself so you can escape. And you're like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's your job. Everything feels much more like, there's much less personality and personal connection between people in all of the other ones in all the other adaptations. This one really focuses on that. So there's certain things that are, this is Dune. We have to do it. And calling out the Gom Jabbar where he's putting his hand in the box and she's got the poison to his neck. That's been one of the best representations of that scene. I've, I've, I've seen as well where it's about him overcoming his fear and there's a point where he switches from being from managing what's going on to taking control and power. And, and that dynamic between the two actors in that one is better represented here than it has been in the past as well. So that was that really made me feel like, oh, yes, there is something going on here. Whereas in the past, it's just been like, oh, the book talked about this and it was really cool. Let's do it. This built up a character it showed that there was something more going on. I think it also helped a little bit that his mom was outside the door also talking about fear. Yeah. And I think that helped kind of the, incorporate the two different yeah. scenes, I guess. Mm-hmm. But it's still well, having, the same story. Yeah, having that, the it's the litany against fear, which is one of the more famous Dune uh, bits where he talks about fear is the mind killer. Um, having his mom say that I, I i like that choice as well because i think in everything else it's it's something that she's taught paul but he always recites it in, in all of the other things and even in the books it's him reciting it having her going through the, the emotion that she's going through and reciting that i think that built that scene up a lot better as well to where it wasn't just oh here's paul just being a badass it's there's a connection between him and his mom and what's going on and all of that kind of stuff. So that just, that scene was, was very well acted in my opinion. I I really appreciated how they did that. They really touch on, like they, they build the relationship between Paul and his mother a lot more than him and his father, in my opinion. Like they, they do build it a little bit, but I feel like the connection, like he has a much stronger connection with his mother than his father. It's yeah, it's true. Thinking through the book and, and the story and all that kind of stuff, but that's because his father does die pretty early on in the story. The scene where his where they're in the graveyard and they're talking about being a leader and Paul saying, mm-hmm. "If I don't want to, if I don't want to answer the call," and his dad says, "You know, you'll still be everything I ever needed you to be." And my son, I think that's a really important scene. That's like the biggest scene that they really had between the two of them, and it, it showcases, I think. Paul's place where he's he's important but there's too much that takes him away Paul is the most important thing to him but he's got to manage everything that's going on and he understands the difficult situations that they're being thrown into politically and so he's trying to do everything that he can to protect because yeah a lot of the scenes that you would think would be a father and son it's Paul and someone else right it's he's training with the battle master to learn how to fight. He's, he's talking to Duncan Idaho. Idaho. It's like, he's got multiple father figures throughout the story, but he's only ever got the one motherly figure. So one thing I will also say that I really absolutely love, I went and saw it in IMAX um, 
probably a much different experience than if you watched it on HBO Max or whatever HBO is. Because the voice that they use when they did those those voice effects, you could feel it. It actually rumbled in your chest and in the seat and throughout as, as you went. So the impact of some of those things, I think, were probably pretty were probably better. I, I've seen it on uh, uh, or clips and things on YouTube. They did a good job with it, but it doesn't. It didn't quite hit as hard as actually feeling the voice. So, I will say to add on top of that, I think that this movie did very well in the sound designing and the mixing, mm-hmm. where you had scenes that were really loud, like a fight scene, and then it would incorporate a more quiet scene. And one that really stands out is. They're in hiding. It's right before Duncan is sacrificing himself. But you have the guys who are slowly falling through the air into the ground. And yeah. it's basically silence. And I thought that, that that was an interesting choice. And I actually really liked it. So a lot of the sound designing and mixing for this movie, I think, was done very well to either provide tension or to enhance the action. Because even when those guys descend earlier, like it's during a battle, there's sound design of everything that's going on, but not with them. Because that's, you know, that's part of, I guess, who they are. They can silently just appear, right? That's that's what they're building up with that. It's these guys, these guys are as, they're, they're an elite military force because that's what they are. And so, uh, but it's an example that this movie does very well of less is more and keep it simple, stupid. In explaining the world, I think that's kind of their driving factor with a lot of things is you don't have to complicate this story by what this story is. You know, focus on the important things. Don't worry about the things that aren't. Showcase the characters. Showcase the things that you need to showcase. Don't make it a spectacle. Specifically the Baron, because we haven't talked much about that. So Stellan Skarsgård plays the Baron Harkon and who's a big fat man. He's massive and he floats around and in everything else he's ever. I I think, I I think it could, should kind of be prefaced. When you say big fat man, it's not like he's, you know, wide, he's just really tall and then kind of, he's also, he's he's also really wide. I mean, even, even in the books, he's, he's massive and it's, I don't know. And that's why when I think big fat man, I think like a big fat man, I just think that he's really tall and it kind of proportions out a little extra. Me. So that's why it's, I think that that should be prefaced. The, the, the costume and, and, and effects department spent months building out a fat suit for him. That's his character. That's who he is. I mean, he floats around. It's how he's been portrayed and everything else. It's the thing I'm getting at with that is that character in all of the other ones, they've leaned more into stereotypical negative things within those realms and this one doesn't do that baron and all of the other iterations is like a fast talking conniving manipulative almost used car salesman approach to things and he's supposed to be this terrifying presence they're not a good just people that's the difference between the houses and this is a time where the baron felt terrifying not gimmicky and not comical. Like he's conniving and manipulative in a menacing way, not in a goofy over the top way. I can't remember if it's the 84 version or even the miniseries when the assassination attempt is made, when, when the, when Duke Leto bites into the tooth and releases the poison, he floats up to the ceiling in his old version and is like, still alive. I'm alive. I survived. Ah, ha, ha. And it's just crazy <laughs> and over the top. And it's, this is, you don't see what happens to him until after. And I think that that, like, that was the moment where I was just like, Oh, did they actually kill him off? And they're going to just give the rest of his, true. his approach to another character. And then he's just like cowering up on the ceiling, like, uh, but when he comes out and he's got the big long dress effectively, like that's imposing. That's what the character is, is imposing. And that's where his nephew Raban played by Dave Bautista in this is that he's physically large. He's 
terrifying. You don't want to meet him because he's brutal as is stated in this. Like that's, that's who these people are. And in the past they've been portrayed as more slimy and disgusting and manipulative where this is, they're terrifying. And I, I just, I like that a lot. I, I will use this as a moment of transition into the dislikes. Uh, the Baron. I There were some moments that I think they just didn't hold up in the, I guess, the CGI as well as the realistic as- aspect of the fat suit. There were some moments that it just, it fell flat in the design of it. I, I wish that it could have been done better because, as you mentioned, he's supposed to be this big imposing character that's that instills fear into you, but... There were just moments with, I guess, his costume that I just, I didn't like, and I wish that it could have been done better. And I was going to say, I think it's kind of strange that the Baron survived the poison attack, but everyone in the room died. So isn't the poison itself a gas stuck in the room? So shouldn't the Baron be dead as well? In the past, it's always been like, there's just been a little cloud and it was just, just supposed to get him and it missed because he floated up. Whereas this, you know, filled the entire room. And I guess the idea is still that he floated up to the ceiling and survived. And they didn't discover like that just until they went covered into... covered a layer on the ground. Yeah. Like ground yeah, level it or stayed, something. It stayed low. But that's the idea is that because he could float, that's how he survived and got out of it. But even then with this, he didn't come out completely unscathed. And I'm trying to remember because that, scene. that whole scene was weird to me. Um, so they showed when he released the tooth and like, the Baron's reaction to it. And then didn't it cut like at that point? And then later it came back and he's like stuck up on the ceiling. To me, that was really weird. It's like, Oh, (laughs) he like cockroached his way up there, but we didn't show it. And like the shot looked weird. And the whole way that that unfolded to me was like, like, I get it. I get what happened, but. Well, and and that's why I, I looked at it just like, there's no way that the Baron survived that. And so that's what yeah. I was thinking. This is going to be a massive change and people are probably going to hate this and, and yell about this. And I thought, because they've already removed one of those Harkonnen characters, as far as we know. So it's like, so to just kill off the, and then have his nephew maybe take over that role. That's, I was like, that's a bold choice. And I might, I'm going to go along with it, but you're going to piss off a lot of people. But yeah, I, I, I was surprised by that scene, but I think that the, maybe they'll explain that one a little bit more. Maybe that's, there is some negative, I think, to the the sparseness in the explanations or the things they choose to explain. Yeah, I was surprised when they came back and it's like, oh, no, he did make it. OK, great. I fully thought that they had that was a big change. So I think that they could have done that a little bit different. I don't know how they would have done that differently, though. They could have just yeah. shown him floating out more. Yeah. At the end, he's he's moving and, up, and, and then it cuts. Yeah. So the way that I remember the scene is it doesn't cut directly from the scene itself. It it cuts the doors and the close. Baron disappears and the doors are closing and you see the effects of everyone else in the room dying. Yeah. But you just don't see the Baron. Yeah. So I think you're he not falls left back. to understand where he yeah. goes if he if he falls back onto the floor and dies. Because it did seem like in that scene, he did still take a heavy dose mm-hmm. of the poison because it was yeah, born yeah, directly like he, into his face. Yeah. So that's one of those you are left wondering, how did you survive this, taking as big of a dose of the poison as you did? I hope that they did. They do showcase that in the next one, that there is more of a physical, like a long-term effect where that's where the boils and the sores and those kinds of, that disgusting aspect of him comes in because of that, rather than it's always just been part of him. That, well, that was a big negative for me. And I think in not having read the books, any of them in the, in the series, I think it kind of hinders your understanding of some of the science behind some of what they have, like the hologram suits. It's confusing to me that you can use them and not take damage, but then you can still take damage through them Slow and damage. die. It's really weird. and That's about how they're explained in, in the book and in everything else is the suits are, they can stop fast moving objects and that's it. And so, yeah, but that's what's so strange is because if you get into a fight, what counts as a fast moving object? Is it like, what is the speed that requires a stop versus not? And yeah. so it's just really strange. Just a lot of the science behind it. 
So if it's not explained in the book, I guess that's just the It's not explained any more than writing. that. Like that's that's one of those Dunisms that comes up where the, the the saying the slow blade breaks the shield or penetrates the shield. The slow mm-hmm. blade penetrates the shield. Like that's a line out of the book and like that's how it's explained is that yeah, we've got these shields that can stop bullets. That's why we don't have a bunch of guns for, you know, and combat's much more personal because we're fighting with swords again, but it's sl- it's slow. I think it, it was is, explained it, well enough. Yeah, it's just it's one of the it's it's a MacGuffin explanation where it's like here's the technology, here's what it is, but you're like okay, but you guys can bend space and time, you guys can't build a shield. And I think they do go into more detail in the books where you the shields are personal shields, and so you can fine tune them, tune them how you want, down to where yes, not even air can move through it. I will say, if you haven't seen the, the shields in the 1984 version, check them oh. out after you watch this video. Go and do that. That is. There is a training scene between, so it's Kyle MacLachlan and Patrick Stewart training in the suits, and it's 1984's amazing graphics. Like It's fantastic. If you haven't seen it, check it out. I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, there's, there's some of those things that, like, it's, it's tough to explain the technology, right? Like, it's like the same with the uh, recycled water, t- water suits. In my brain, I'm thinking, okay, it makes sense. They're on a, on a planet that... I don't know if they really have water on the planet. They talk about the core itself. I guess it's the core, but you, they could it's, turn it into a paradise yes. planet, but they stopped because of the spice. But being that it's a desert, it makes sense to have a recycled water suit. But that that's they not never really used explained. properly. Like they never had the face yeah, mask on. They should have got rid of the nose hose. That was just a stupid looking. Hose. They had the face mask. Use the face mask. Get rid of the nose yep. hose. That just looked weird and stupid. Well, it, it's no just it's and, a suit that yeah. isn't really explained though, because I'm I'm one I'm one who's gonna nitpick it because I'm thinking okay if it's recycled water is it like really high recycled water like pure water given that it's thirty thousand yep. years in the future it is. or is it not because you see them kind of drinking it and they're just kind of like uh, like I really don't like the taste of this but it's thirty years in the future wouldn't you think that by that point it's, they would have been able to fine tune the suits to make them as it's, good as they could, especially because they're on a desert planet. It, it, Just how is. science it, it, isn't yeah. explained. And it, it's one of those things like you can't necessarily have the story going forward without like, if I've got a suit that can stop everything. Okay, great. There's no, there's no way you to progress that story. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause you're, you're invincible at that point in time. My, my issues with some of those kinds of things is, there is still a lot of exposition. They do it well with presenting the information to a character and by extension, the audience. Um, you know, Paul's sitting there reading a book and watching a hologram about, you know, about Arrakis and about all of that. So that's where they give you a lot of that information. It's still a scene where you're just, someone's telling you what's going on. I appreciate that they did it better. Um, and I, d- I don't know of any other way to do it is the thing. Like I don't necessarily like exposition or too much exposition, but I don't know how you do it different with a story. Like how do you explain an alien planet without just explaining the alien planet? Right. Yeah. You know, every time they see the sandworm, you know, they, they, they explain what it is. They're flying over the city and there's a shield wall. They mention the shield wall. Like, yep, it's to stop the sandworms from coming in to get us. Like you just have to do that. And it's presented as the characters are learning it, which I appreciate, but I, I think it's, it's, it's a hurdle for filmmakers. <laughs> You know, it's the show me, don't tell me. There are some things that are very difficult to sh- to show without explanation. And there's some certain things that, I mean, explanation doesn't do it justice. And so it's, 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 a, it's an interesting problem to solve with filmmaking. It's, it's easy for me because I know the story. I know the history. Like, you don't know how the still suits work. I, I do. There's a bunch of filters throughout them. It's powered by the, there's a little motor in the heel. When you walk, it powers the suit and it filters out everything and then there's a little pocket that you open up and it drops all the solid waste out <laughs> like you know but yeah, it pulls the moisture out of everything like but if that without that being explained you know it's it's hard for me to see the movie not knowing all of those things like i can't look at it with fresh eyes but i think that's also kind of what they have to juggle as well with the audience with people that are heavy dude fans and i've read the books and like know a lot of it or yeah. versus people that are coming in blind or don't really know anything about it, right? And yeah. so trying to bridge, make a movie that, that appeals to both sides without, you know, they got to find that middle ground. 
Yeah, and I think this balances it very well. I'm trying to think through other dislikes because I, um, I didn't like the, the the sound effect they used for the dragonfly helicopters. They just use like a regular helicopter sound. Like they they should have done something different. Because um, like that just just never felt right to me. Like I hear a helicopter, but it's this dragonfly. The dragon flappy fly. wing rotor device, but it has a regular helicopter sound like that. That mix didn't work for me at all. What did you guys think about the uh, the music and the soundtrack? Um, it felt weird to me yeah. overall. Yeah, I couldn't even remember it because as I've been thinking through it all, it's it's very prevalent in the trailers as well, if I remember right. And that's the way it feels to me throughout the film. It feels like trailer music. Like there's not much of a score beyond how you would score the trailer to be impactful to, to get you to want to see this movie. I wouldn't necessarily. I was trying I, to remember yeah. the music, but I, I don't remember. It's, I don't remember a specific scene that had music in it. Well, the thing is, remember. I don't, what I don't it know was. if a lot of people would call it music in a lot of cases. Like yeah. it's tones and chanting, and there's some scenes with it, but it's yeah. I remember there was one scene that they started playing some music and it just didn't feel like it fit. Um, and so I remember there, there was one scene, I can't remember which scene it was off the top of my head, but like while I was watching it, I was like, eh, I don't know if this is the best choice. And like yeah. that, that did, that one scene did stand out to me um, when I was watching it. Yeah, it's certainly not a score I'm going to go and listen to on my own. I don't know. I didn't like it. I'm going to, I'm going to put that in my negative column because it didn't feel like a score. It felt like, it felt like sound effects mostly not, yeah. not music. I'll say this just to say it. Cause I know that, you know, people have called it out the idea of the white savior. And to me, it, it's one of those, it's a problem, but I think it's more of a problem with the original story itself and given I, that you mentioned the story was like the 1950s or something when it was written. I, I, so, I, I think, mean, it makes sense that it was more of a white savior. But I in, think in talking the, about this movie and the way that this the movie is separate from the book, it's a problem. But I know that it's a problem with the original story. It's interesting because it's not. I understand it's yeah white savior, but it's also I wouldn't call it a savior story. Knowing it full well and everything that's going into it, I hope that they make Children of D- or Dune Messiah, the, the second book. I hope that they, they make that because they've, they've talked about how they want to do that because it's a lot more complex than just a white savior story. I'll say that. It does have those elements to it, but the point of it is more how the system that they have is broken and the way that they fix it is also broken. If they make the next one, I I hope that they incorporate this scene. It's a scene in Dune Messiah. Paul looks back at his legacy through the, the veil of history, and he's thinking back to the stories that he's heard from Earth, and specifically World War II, and how, how much of an atrocity that was, and how minuscule it was in comparison to everything that's happened since then. And the wars that humanity has fought since then. And he says that while he's standing in a room, a room that is like miles by miles high. I mean, he's like the the grandeur and excess that the humanity has built and the atrocities that have been committed and the things that are remembered as atrocities and how they're minuscule in comparison, because we were billions of people across a galaxy now. And so the numbers involved are so dramatically different. It's to the people who, have issues with white savior be interesting to have that conversation after the second one comes out to see, to see how well, how that's addressed. I should say like this didn't feel like a white savior. I mean, it is, if you think of the story of the, the Fremen being oppressed on the planet and from the, the, the Atreides coming in to save yeah. them. Yeah. And okay. you know, I mean, it opens, it opens with who are our new oppressors? Right. Um, but the Atreides are also trying to work with them. Like that's their goal is, but the Duke, Duke Leto, his 
he makes that point of we've risen to supremacy in the past through air power and sea power. Those aren't, that's not how we're going to win on Dune on, on Arrakis. We're going to have to win with desert, desert power. And power. we find what that is. I, I hated that. And so, I hated that saying yeah, that was, that, the, that, that was saying, super yes. cheesy. It's Please. Also a Dunism. It. It's also like, a Dunism. Um, that is that in the yeah. sand walking, like, okay, come up with a better sand dance. That was that in desert power, like really pu- pulled me out of it. And I'm like, this is really like cheesy. I will say it's, it's, it's a much more complex story when it comes to the white savior than other things. Not, not saying that it's, it's not without its faults, but it's, it's certainly a, a topic to discuss, I think, rather than this is a major fault that needs to be changed with how stories are told. I, I know it's a concern for people, but it's also, this is half the story. So, and Frank Herbert himself has had some pretty interesting discussions on those that I've seen interviews from the past. So I, it's like, I said, it's, it's certainly, it's more of an interesting topic rather than a, this is bad. We should stop it. All right. We, we want to transition into changes aside from, you know, dunisms. I think that was, would be my change is the change. Some of the dunisms. Cause even like, Oh, it's the shield wall. It's like, Let's just point to this thing that people who know the story or have read the books or those kinds of things are going to recognize. And people who are new to the story, it's not going to mean that much to them. Like desert power or the, the walk, <laughs> the desert dance, like the Gamja bar. Like you're pointing, you're just talking about things. The, the slow blade penetrates the shield. Like It's almost like to make people who have read the books just squeal in joy like, oh my gosh, yep, they said that's, it. Yeah, that's, that's what it feels like to me. I like them. Like it's sayings that come out like, you know, there's the spice must flow, which I don't think they say in this. The only thing I can think of is they might've said it in the beginning exposition when they were talking yeah. about the, the, the spice on the planet and people wanting it for money and power and things like that. They yeah. might've said it in the beginning exposition, but I mean, there's things that have just kind of permeated pop culture that I just, yeah, I would, I would leave those out or, or stray away from them as much as you can. Like, it's the nerdier side of sci-fi that I think pulls people away from sci-fi in general. And I think that's, I think you should shy away from those when you're trying to make something for the general public. Yeah. I think for me, it might just be along the lines of a little bit more understanding in the science behind it. And I get that it might be hard because you are talking about something that is, you know, so far in the future. So it might be hard to explain some of the science, but I would just like a little bit more explanation in the science And in you bringing up the idea of the music, I think I would incorporate music because I didn't remember any of the music in it. And I think that that's kind of, I guess, disappointing given that I do believe this movie is very well made in just what they've done with it and everything involved with it. And so I think that not having music to help enhance and incorporate into the story, I think is a disappointing situation because yeah, I don't remember the music. If there was even music or if it was just tonal sounds that you could mistake as just sound effects. There was chanting so. and singing and that kind of stuff in it, but it was acapella. Like I said, yeah, it just, it felt, it felt intentional, but it didn't feel like a score like an epic grand score that you yeah. would maybe think. And of I don't even think you need an epic grand score for this, but just something more to just enhance what's already there. Yeah. Nugget, what other changes? Anything else you would change we haven't discussed or specific? So so one thing I haven't really talked about is I felt like it was like the shots were really long. I felt like almost everything was really long. And that's probably why it's a two and a half hour movie. Felt like a very dramatic, slow moving film. It's the setup to a movie is what it feels like. Yeah. But I feel like it could have sped up at some point. I I just felt like it was just like, just meandering in the pace. The events happen pretty quick, right? Like all of a sudden they're under attack and everything's everything's dying. Everything's blowing up. But even that kind of drags out a lot longer in this version than it does in previous adaptations. Like everything happens kind of in one night in previous adaptations, whereas this kind of, it's not just, oh, we attack and 
all of this stuff happens. It's stuff kind of plays out over some time. Mm-hmm. So, and apparently there was some risk of there not being part two, like part two wasn't solidified, but it would have been very unfortunate if I think they didn't make a sequel because this really is a setup. I feel kind of shortchanged that I spent two and a half hours watching this just to have it end where it ended. It does feel like a setup, a two and a half hour setup to an actual story. Where it ends, especially, and I know a lot of people have complained about this as well, is like you marketed this movie as starring Zendaya and yeah. she's not <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> she's in some flashbacks and some visions. And then like I the think last for 10 a total minutes, of maybe five, 10 minutes, yeah. given the amount of screen time she had, I think yeah. it is close and, to that. And she's a big, important character who shows up in the story like they, they show that she she presents herself in the story as in the time frame that she would. But that's when they end the movie. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's it's some interesting choices. And I think it's unfortunate. It would have been nice if they had like made the movies and it was like, OK, we're going to Lord of the Rings style. Right. We're going to release one every year because, yeah, now we've got to wait two years for the next one. Right. So I can see the second one probably not doing as well as this one, because people who don't know the story who aren't already waiting for this this to come out. If, you, if this movie didn't get you because it's a two and a half hour setup, mm-hmm. I can see you not wanting to go to the theater to see the next one. Like you're going to wait until, you know, you're going to wait until it comes out on HBO, which maybe it'll come out on HBO at the same time. But we're going to be like, they screwed me with the first one. And, and I have seen a lot of people saying that on social media where they're just like, what is going on? I don't know what this is. I don't care. I'm very much looking forward to the next one because I think the setup is proof of concept that they're going to do right by it all right uh may shy halud bless all passings i can't remember i'm i I talk about being a hardcore nerd and i don't remember any of the sayings it's because my brain don't work so um let us know in the comments down below what you thought of dune um let us know in the comments down below what you thought of the 1984 versions of the personal shields um because if you haven't gone to see those go look them up and leave a comment down below about yay or nay on Captain Picard in a weird CG box suit. And we will catch you guys in the next one. Adios. See ya.